So what do we have? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 3, 24. Yeah, not bad. I didn't have any expectations of who would or wouldn't come. Some of you said you would. Some of you said couldn't make it. I knew we had 14 people who were willing to go over to Baxter Brainerd today. And depending on what the weather turns out, maybe it was a good thing that we didn't drive over today. We'll see. You never know. But uh, when 14 people said they were willing to go, that was exciting to me. And I was very happy and pleased to have that. And frankly, quite disappointed that because of the lack of pre-registrations, I had 14 people. I thought they had plenty. Come on. But because they didn't have enough, they uh, decided to to postpone and or probably not do the event until next, possibly fall or spring. So we'll see. Um, And and it may be in a different location. I don't know. We'll find out from them. But uh, it's going to be a neat neat event. And so then when that kind of didn't come together and the opportunity, I knew 14 people had a Saturday morning that they had blocked off for me. I said, let's take advantage of that. And a few more of you came. So so that is great. Um, My plan is we're going to do a couple of different things today. We're going to watch a video. It's an older video. I saw this video um, in 2003. Um, I was part of the Willow Creek Leadership Summit. And if you've not been to one of those, it's really a neat event. Um, Outside of all the baggage from Willow Creek, separate from any of that, a number of their speakers over the years have been truly life-changing. Just uh, the things that they spoke really spoke to me. And so I'm going to share one of those videos. It's a guy by the name of Erwin McManus. Um, We've had a long-term relationship with Erwin. He passes a church called Mosaic Church in the Los Angeles area. And we as Converge have had a long-term relationship with him. He comes and speaks at Bethel probably once or twice a year and has has served kind of as a special advisor um, and and done a number of things. And so just just a very interesting guy, very gifted communicator. Those of you who last year did some of the Andy Stanley um, Bible study stuff and got to see how gifted he is at communication. Erwin McManus is pretty much probably at that same level. He's one of the few guys I would say uh, can approach Andy Stanley and how he communicates. And, and so that, that means he's compelling and interesting and, and is good at what he does. Uh, you'll see as we watch that video, it's a small format because it was recorded before everybody had widescreen TV. <laughs> it's an old enough video, but it's now I guess 17 years old. It's hard for me to believe it was 17 years ago or 16 years ago I watched this for the first time and got to see it live. But uh, um, So we'll watch that and then we're going to go through. So there's, there's a couple of different tools we're going to go through and look at and use. Uh, I'm going to be working off of some stuff developed by our denominational president, Scott Riddout. Scott's really a, a compelling man and we'll get to watch as long as our internet cooperates. We have new internet, so we can stream videos now and we're excited about that. So we're going to try to watch one of his videos later on. <clears throat> and um, the notes that I'm using today to kind of spur our conversation. I'm not going to be a talking head the whole time. I'm going to talk. I'm going to instigate. But we have paper, pens, Bibles, sticky notes. We're also going to do some conversations. We're going to take a little time later on and, and maybe do a little wandering through the church and do some examination um, and, and just kind of see... See what we see and see where it takes us. My goal is in this, um, hopefully to equip, hopefully to encourage, and and certainly to inspire at the very least. Um, One of the things when I came here, I was hired and, well, I guess offered the job um, the day that Steve Sandberg was killed. Um, That was the Sunday. If you were here, um, we literally accepted the job. Well, no, what had happened was the church was going to vote. They sent us to Tanya and Kevin's house. We came back. The church voted. We went out and celebrated. And within about five minutes, got notification that Steve had been killed. So that's when I started, as far as being hired by the church. I started January 24th. And one of the things that I've said, and I've said it repeatedly, and I'll keep saying it because that's just what I'm going to do, is I'm going to push, and I'm going to challenge, and I'm going to encourage, and I'm going to equip, and I'm going to just do whatever it takes, hopefully, to create a culture where people are telling people about Jesus. And you're either going to get on board and start doing it, or you're going to fire me. One of the two things will eventually happen, <laughs> is my suspicion, because I'm not going to give up. And, and, and that is, you know, <clears throat> what I believe we're called to do, um, to make disciples. And I make no apologies about it. I I need make no apologies, hopefully, about it within a church. 
And so my vision has always been that, and, and that needs to motivate us and push us and um, encourage us, like I said, and inspire us and all the other things that, that we might find ways to impact our families. Because as we talk about people today, this is your brothers, your sisters, your children, your grandchildren. Um, we want to impact our neighborhoods, you know, and your neighborhood might be different than my neighborhood, of course, because I live in town, many of you don't, but you still have neighbors. And how do we connect and reach and evangelize and share with them? And there's a number of tools that we can use to do that, um, but it's got to start in our hearts. And so we're going to talk about some of those kinds of things. And then it outflows from that, of course, into not just the Aiken community, but the greater community. We, we support you know, people like Waihan, who works in the Twin Cities and works with uh, missionaries or works as a missionary with students who come into the University of Minnesota. And we go and do things with Feed My Starving Children or uh, we're going to go to some of us to the LAPS banquet, the Lakes Area Pregnancy Services banquet over in Brainerd. And uh, I think it's a month from today, and actually a month from yesterday um, is that banquet over, over I think, at Craigans. And so, so it expands from there. And how do we impact that? And, and then, of course, it goes global. Um, I think we have a, a very impressive global impact, considering, you know, we're we're a little church in the North Shore of Lake Mille Lacs, right? But uh, when you look at our giving and the generosity and the things that we do, um, I think at that level we're we're definitely, you know, we're, we're doing quite well. And uh, I'm always proud to tell people about what it is that we do at Glory Baptist Church. And so that's just kind of, you know, that's the onion. And each one of those is a different layer, but they're all connected, of course, in an onion. They all have, uh, they all rely on one another as they grow. And we're going to start, of course, kind of on the inner. And the very first thing we're going to do is we are, I really don't want to order it this way, but he is better than I am, so we're just going to watch him first. Um, we're going to watch this video from Erwin McManus and then uh, have some discussion after it and see what it spurs and inspires. You'll see a couple of things, and um, he's, he's going to kind of hint at it. He had come to the Will Creek Leadership Summit to speak. He was one of the scheduled speakers. And one of the other speakers, if I remember correctly, had gotten sick the night before, literally to the point that he wasn't going to be able to speak the next day. And so they came to him and said, hey, will you fill this slot? And he's like, well, okay. You know, I mean, it's, it's, somebody's got to. So he did. And he's going to reference that about right at the very beginning about a phone call that he gets. And that's, that's why he's speaking. And uh, he's speaking without notes because he was unprepared for this. He didn't have a plan for it. And I think sometimes, in my experience, um, that's when some of our best speaking comes. Is, you know, I've, I've walked away from nursing homes going, I just preached the best sermon I've ever preached because I just let it rip. <laughs> and that's kind of what he does here. And so there are a few places you'll see, eh, if you're very linear in your thought, you'll get a little rabbit trail <laughs> here and there. But give him a, a bit of grace in that as, as he goes because uh, that's, that's the, the understory or the backstory of, of how he got to speaking at this event at that time. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, hopefully the coffee is finished percolating. If you need thicker, stronger, more flavorful coffee, I think it's probably done out there by now. It just takes a while. Uh, it is a uh, chocolate caramel brownie. If you didn't get some of it, it's got a nice flavor. We did do a pot of regular. If you are just, you know, you got to have your regular Joe, that's fine too. We've got that as well. And if you're like me, you don't like coffee, I have energy drinks, I could go get you one. Okay? We have those. There's lots of snacks, treats, donuts, oranges, nuts. If you want something healthy, I thought of you, Richard, so that there was at least something you'd eat. Um, <laughs> so I grabbed the gorp and throw out the chocolate, or we won't tell Lisa, whichever you prefer. Um, <laughs> So we've got that. Uh, bathrooms, everybody's been here, so you all know where we're going and what we're doing. And, uh, and then after we do the Barbarian Way, we're going to talk and see just how long that goes. Today is pretty open in its formatting, but my commitment to you is we're going to be done by noon. Um, I don't want to take all of your day. I know you have other stuff. I value your time, and I appreciate deeply your willingness to come. And so I will make sure we're done by then. But So we'll start out with Erwin, and then we're going to do, as I said... Um, this evangelistic environment conversation. Today is going to be kind of evangelism focused, and, and I don't feel bad about that. I think, you know, so we've got, I knew Gary was coming, and we've got Gary who goes to a prison and, and shares the gospel with people regularly, and he's a Gideon, and he gets to give Bibles away. And so, so we, we've got somebody kind of with a, a long-term background like that, 
And then we, we have somebody else in the room who's like, maybe going, I don't like to tell people about Jesus because I'm very uncomfortable speaking or I've just never done it or I'm afraid or I tried once and I screwed it up or, you know. And then I knew we we're going to have this range. So it's tough to select exactly what it is. So if you're, if you're seasoned, hopefully it's review. And hopefully uh, my experience is when I, like I go to a preaching seminar, I've been preaching for quite a while, I still get stuff. And I still, it refines me. And so I, I find that uh, very useful to go and be re-exposed to maybe concepts I've heard many times before, but something usually clicks, something anew. And, and, and the background for that is, uh, I heard Billy Graham speak one time, and um, it was a relatively intimate group of about 100 people, which for him is a small group, um, if you know how, how many people he spoke to over the years. So it was about 100 pastors, and people he was speaking to and and uh, he was answering some Q&A at the end and and somebody said well Billy you're 77 or whatever years old at the time you've been reading the Bible your whole life you're devout you know you read because he had said yeah I'll read through the Bible two three times in a year or whatever and he was just kind of talking about his his own spiritual formation and journey and what he does and so somebody said you know so if this is what you do you've read the Bible probably at least this many times tell us what you're getting from it today, kind of question. And it wasn't meant as a gotcha. They were, they were legitimately asking it. And he said, you know, he said, aside from what I'm kind of getting currently, he said, you should know. I've read the Bible all these times. But he said, every single time I go through, every single time I read it, every time I get to the text and I go through it, I, I continually find new nuggets every single year. He said, I go to the same gold mine, but there's always new veins. And, and he said, it, it doesn't matter how many times I've maybe read this passage of Ephesians, he said, in this season of life, it, it might hit me a little bit differently than it did just a year ago. And this was, I think, right after he had first been diagnosed with cancer the first time. And so it just, I think it was prostate cancer, if I remember right. But anyhow, so um, just to hear a man of that seasoning say, we can go to that well and keep going to that well, and it keeps yielding, or go to that mine, I think is the term he used, and that it keeps yielding these nuggets. And I think that's often the same when we go and we hear something about evangelism. I'm not going to tell you anything you've probably not heard, even if you're not comfortable sharing your faith. But hopefully something in this will inspire you, will equip you, and will challenge you along the way. And the reason I, I wanted to start with uh, the barbarian way of Erwin McManus is very much like the, the personal. It's, it's the, the core. And then we'll hopefully expand out in our next couple of sessions um, as we talk about that, but starting very at the personal level, and then we'll go to those other items, and then um, when we're done, we're all going to go downtown and share our faith with somebody. Uh, no, no I'm kidding, but it wouldn't be a bad practice. But uh, but you will be done by noon today, and uh, hopefully, like I said, as we do this um, with 24 of us, this will be a day that we can look back on a year, two years, five years from now, and go, there's fruit from that endeavor. Um, there's a new family here. There's a kid who came to Wednesday here. There's somebody I told who lives somewhere else, but it opened their eyes or their hearts to the gospel. And if that's the case, and it's even just that one person, this was all worth it, in my opinion. And so that is what we're going to do. I think it's good to be here this morning. A.R. Bernard got sick and couldn't come. I came and got sick. <laughs> so they wake me up at 2.15 this morning and, and invite me to uh, be a part of this. And about an hour later, I, I, I woke up my wife, Kim, and I said, Honey, she goes, What? What? And I said, uh, Was I dreaming or did Willow Creek call me? And she said, well, I don't know. Was there someone on the phone when you were talking? <laughs> and I said, I just, I just you know, did, did the phone actually ring? She goes, yeah, yeah, it rang. I said, okay, okay, so it was them. And uh, Jim, I want to thank you and Bill for allowing me to spend the evening in the bathroom. <laughs> and so I just rolled out of bed, fell on the floor, got on my knees, you know what I'm talking about? Put my face in my hands, soon... I was drowning in a pool of tears, and I said, all right, Lord, if my humiliation is necessary to advance your kingdom, 
that I'm your guy. <laughs> and then in classic, classic Willow form, Jim says, hey, did you bring your notes on your talk on being a barbarian? Notes? What are you talking about, man? <laughs> sure, open up your notes <laughs> to Matthew chapter 11. Let's read together. I, I like to do something kind of old-fashioned all over North America, if we could. Uh, I like for us to stand as we read God's Word. Would you do that with me? Matthew 11, beginning verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? And Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men and women lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. So what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the flute for you, but you did not dance. We, we sang the dirge, but you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her actions. You may be seated, and let's pray together. Thank you, Lord God, so much for inviting us into your presence this day. And God, I thank you for your compassion toward us. But even more, God, I thank you for your passion for us. And I ask you, Lord God, to infuse your dreams, the power of your imagination that creates and brings life into our souls. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would set us free of all the trappings and layers that have diminished the power of your church and the energizing force of your spirit within us. Jesus, we as your followers ask you to guide us through this morning, to lead us on the path where barbarians find their way out of civilization. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen and amen. I remember when I came to faith in Jesus Christ in August of 1978, I, I was a, a blank slate. I, I didn't know anything about Christianity. I'm from El Salvador, came here as a kid, went back and forth for several years. I, I was sort of a, a religious eclectic. My grandmother taught me Catholicism, though never took me to church. And my grandfather drove me by a house where he said he had lived as an eight-year-old boy and had died and was reincarnated. And so I grew up as a, a Catholic Hindu or a, a Christian Buddhist or something like that. And, you know, the one advantage of that, of course, is that Jesus can save you in every life. And, <laughs> but, 
but growing up with sort of this hodgepodge, this mixed views of God and reality, I eventually just sort of moved from mysticism to agnosticism to atheism back to mysticism and then became a philosophy student in college. And, and during that time, I was confronted with the person of Jesus Christ. And, and I'll never forget what it was like in those first hours and moments as a follower of Jesus. And, and I look back and I realize, I mean, I was such a barbarian. Have you ever met a barbarian Christian? You know, one of those barbarian followers of Jesus Christ that don't know all the rules yet. They, they just sort of came to faith really fast since you didn't have a enough time to indoctrinate them or to, you know, coach them through what it means to be a Christian. And I don't know why this happened, but there was a man in, in the church where I came to faith, and he came up and asked me my name, and I wrote it down, Erwin Raphael McManus. And as you can see, I'm not Irish. Robin, I wish I were, but I'm from El Salvador, but I have a good Irish name, McManus. And... <laughs> And he asked me my name, I wrote it down, and hours after I became a follower of Christ, this man walked up to me and gave me a leather-bound Thompson chain reference King James Bible. And my name was engraved on there. That was so cool. And he looked at me and he said, two and a half years ago, a man named Scott gave me a Bible. And he said to me that God has called me to preach the gospel. And two or three years before that, a man came up to Scott and said that God had waited, he had spoken to him and told him to, to give a Bible to someone that would be called to preach the gospel. And he said, this has been passing from generation to generation, and I've been waiting, and you're that man. God has called you to preach the gospel, and he gave me this Bible. And I thought, wow, this is so neat. Every Christian gets their own Bible guy. This is beautiful. And <laughs> so I got my Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Now, I graduated with a pretty strong straight D from high school. I mean, first through 12th grade. So as you might gather, I didn't spend a lot of time with Shakespeare. And when I opened up this Bible, I thought, wow, this is so fascinating. I don't understand a word, but it's really cool. It's, it, it's poetic. It's beautiful. It's unintelligible. And, and so I, I began reading the Bible, and I would say to God at night, God, I have no idea what that meant, but maybe you speak in the subconscious experience. And so I thought maybe God would talk in the night, and in the morning I would wake up illuminated. And, but I began in the Gospel of John because it's so easy for a person who has no Christian background to understand what it means in the beginning was the Word. And so I began through John <laughs> and, and tried to understand who Jesus was and who God was, what the Scriptures were telling me. And, and then there was this guy named Gary, and he gave me these little cards with Bible verses on them. And he said, memorize these. So I thought, okay, I guess everyone who's a follower of Jesus Christ memorizes stuff. So I took those little cards and began memorizing them. And they told me to pray and, and, and have a conversation with God. And I assumed that a conversation meant both ways. So I started living under the delusion that I, I not only spoke to God, but that God spoke to me. And, and then I got a phone call three or four days after I became a follower of Christ. And, and, and a guy said, hey, on Friday night, I want you to go with me. And I said, where? And he goes, I want you to go to prison. I said, no, it was my personal goal to never go to prison. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And he goes, no, no, it's going to be really cool. We're going to go there. We're going to talk to the convicts about Jesus Christ. Afterwards, we're all going to go to a football game. And I thought, I like football. <laughs> and, and I said, who's going? He said, a lot of people from the church. And I thought, ah, it's almost like a date. Now, I'd been around this church all summer long, and I could not get a date. Now, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but, but the reason I kept getting was that they wouldn't be unequally yoked. Now, I didn't know what a yoke was, and I couldn't figure out how to get one, and I'm not a cheap guy. I'd go pick up a yoke if that's what I needed to get a date. <laughs> but no one was explaining to me this yoke thing, and so I was very distressed. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, I get it. I got the yoke, baby. So I went ahead... <laughs> And I called this uh, young Christian woman, and I said, hey, do you want to go to prison with me on Friday night? <laughs> and she said, sure. And so I had my first Christian date. We went to a prison, and it was an amazing experience. All the Christians sat down first, and then they had this Christian rock band, and, and then all the convicts started marching in in single file. I mean, they were tough. I mean, crew cuts, butches, lines carved in their heads. And, and those were the women. And I'm looking at this group... <laughs> I think this is hardcore. And all the Christians sat on one side, and all the convicts sat on the other side, and there was an entire row in the middle where no one sat except for me. And that's because I wasn't really sure <laughs> where I belonged at that particular moment. Because to be honest with you, they looked pretty rough and tough, but everybody over here looked like Ken and Barbie, and I, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do that either. And, and after the concert, they moved us into this cafeteria, and we were supposed to sit down with these convicts and talk to them about God. Now, I, I didn't have a lot of coaching, a lot of training. I had one real clear presentation of the gospel, and that was the one that was given to me that Sunday night. 
But I sat down with three convicts, and I had my Thompson chain reference, King James Bible with my name engraved on it, so I knew it was in the book of life. <laughs> and I said, man, I've only been a follower of Jesus for a couple of days, but I wish I could tell you what Jesus means to me. And the guy in the middle said, okay, we're listening. And now I thought to myself, that's the worst thing that could happen right now. <laughs> Someone could actually be interested. I had no idea what to do. But a few minutes later, he was invited to go get some food, and, and while he was gone, someone took his chair. Now, I didn't know a lot about uh, Christianity and a lot about the Bible, but I knew a lot about feeling left out and isolated. And I saw this guy coming back. His chair was taken by a Christian, so he went and stood against the wall. So I went over to him at the wall, and I said, hey, man, um, sorry about the chair. Uh, do you really want to know? Do you want to know about God? And he goes, yeah, I really do. And I said, okay, and he hit me. Those cards. Those verses, they were all in some book called Romans. If I can just find Romans, <laughs> I can help this guy through. It's like, I said, going, you know, in Romans it says, in Romans it says, <laughs> Romans should be in the Old Testament. It should be kings, Romans, countrymen. It should be right there. <laughs> so I'm looking around, I can't find Romans. And that's what I hate about those little cards. They don't give you a page number. And all of a sudden, this man looked at me and he goes, you know, I can't read or write anyway. I said, what? He goes, I can't read. And I said, you, you can't read? He goes, no. And I said, you can't read at all? And he goes, not one bit. And I said, oh. <laughs> I was a barbarian. What do you expect? <laughs> and so I looked at him. I said, you know, in Romans, it's a house. <laughs> I, I think I got close. And about 15 minutes or so later, that guy was yielding his life to Jesus Christ and leading him in prayer to invite Christ to change his life meant more to me than the prayer I prayed the week before. It changed my life forever. And I look back and I think, oh man, it was so much fun being a barbarian. I mean, the Bible wasn't a sword for me, it was a club. You know? <laughs> and I know why God helped me become more effective because he said he's doing so much damage. We've got to do something to help this guy. <laughs> but you know what happens, don't you? You know, we start going to church. We, we, we start being pulled into the magnetic pull of civilized religion. And the truth of the matter, if we would just stop and reflect, is that Christianity is essentially no different than any other world religion. It's as empty and hollow as Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam. And at Mosaic, people come to me and say, are you saying only Christians go to heaven? And I say, of course not. Christians need to come to Jesus, just like Buddhists and Hindus and atheists. And they go, okay. <laughs> as long as it's fair. <laughs> because people outside of Christianity are looking in and they know this cannot possibly be what God meant. But we don't seem to know it. I love this passage of scripture because Jesus shows us the barbarian way out of civilization. He invites us to take off our, our pomp and our, our ritual and all of those outer layers that make us look good and give us great reputations and allow us to admire each other and, and just find our primal way back to the essence of what Jesus Christ was dreaming about while he was agonizing on the cross on our behalf. It's an unusual passage. It says, after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. And when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Now, that's an important question, isn't it? I understand why a person would ask that question. Certainly a, a seeker should ask that question. Is Jesus the one or, or should we look for another? I even understand when those of us who are followers of Christ ask this question when we go through some trauma, some tragedy, some great pain in our life. But I find it to be extraordinary that John the Baptist would ask this question. That John the Baptist would ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? Now, you remember the John the Baptist history, right? Jesus and John are our cousins through, through Mary and Elizabeth. Now, the Bible tells us that, that one day Mary and Elizabeth were in the same place and they were both pregnant, 
And John was inside of his mother Elizabeth, and, and Jesus was inside of his mother Mary. And when Mary entered the room, the Bible says that John left inside of his mother's womb because he knew it was Jesus. Can you imagine, are you the one, or should I look for another? <laughs> Somehow, inside of his mother's womb, he knew that Jesus was the one. Years later, John the Baptist is looking through the crowds, and, and he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He wasn't confused. He wasn't going, which one's Jesus? Oh, these guys, they look the same. Oh, no, there he is, the blonde, blue-eyed son of God. <laughs> Sorry. I just thought I'd throw that in. And, you know, the one non-Jew among all Israel. <laughs> now he knew, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When Jesus came to be baptized, John looked at him and he knew that he was the one that he was unworthy to loosen his sandals. He said, are you the one that's too holy for me to even touch? No, he knew. And when Jesus was baptized, and the scriptures tell us that after he was immersed, and he came out of that water, and it says the Spirit of God came on in the form of a dove. I don't know what that means, but I think that would be an amazing effect, don't you? You think John's going, cool effect? I wonder who the technical director is, you know? I, he knew that Jesus was the one. When he heard the voice from heaven, behold, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. John knew that Jesus was the one. So why is he asking the question now? Well, it's pretty simple, fairly straightforward. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he asked the question. Jesus sends a response. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. What an amazing resume. You go, whoa, you are the one. But John knew all this already. Nothing in this was a surprise to John. In fact, he had heard what Jesus was doing, and it prompted him to question if Jesus was the one. But Jesus adds something to this particular description that, that's out of place. It, it's, it's sort of an aberration. It's, it's a, a theological hiccup. Here it is again. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Oh, and then one other thing, John. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. How many people do you know have fallen away from God because he was raising the dead? How many people have you, have you found going, I just, I just can't believe in God. Too many blind people are seeing. <laughs> have you had people walk away from the faith saying, if one more leper is cured, I'm going to become an atheist. <laughs> so why would Jesus say, blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me? Because this is what he's saying to John. John, you're right. I am the one doing all these things. I am the one who touches the blind and makes him see. I am the one who touches the paralyzed. And makes them walk. I am the one who touches the leper and makes them clean. I am the one who raises the dead. And John, I am the one leaving you in prison. And I am the one that's going to allow you to die on my behalf. You see, the barbarian sees Jesus differently than the one who's been civilized. The civilized view of Jesus says Jesus always comes through for us. Jesus is there to protect us all the time. Jesus is, is, is optimal goal is, is our safety and, and our comfort and our convenience. And, and it, it is wrapped up in the theological expression, the safest place to be is where? The center of the will of God. Isn't that a beautiful expression? I mean, it, isn't that comforting? I mean, it's so beautiful, it's so comforting, it's so unbiblical. The safest place to be is the center of the will of God. Where in the world did we ever get that? Do you think John felt it was safe being in the center of the will of God? I think while Jesus was going out healing other people, leaving John in prison. And when John knew he was going to lose his head over his allegiance to the Son of God. Do you think that John was feeling that it was a really safe place to be? I have thought about this. I thought, okay, if, if the safest place to be is in the center of the will of God, well, what about Paul? I mean, Paul walked with God, and certainly whatever the, the center of the will of God looks like, Paul had to have visited there at least a few times in his life. And, and so I, I began looking at Paul's journals. Now, listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. With, with 
the backdrop or the safest place to be is in the center of the will of God. Paul says, are they servants of Christ? <laughs> am I out of my mind to talk like this? The answer is yes. He goes, I am more. He goes, I have worked much harder, been in prison more severely, been flogged more severely, have been exposed to death again and again. Sound safe to you? Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, the old-fashioned kind, not the more contemporary approach. And <laughs> I just want to make sure you're with me. Oh, all right? Okay. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. Here it is. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. But the safest place to be is the center of the will of God. Where in the world did we get that? I'll tell you where we got it. We got civilized. And we created a religion using the name of Jesus Christ, and we taught people that God's optimal desire for you is for you to live in an insulated bubble where you risk nothing, sacrifice nothing, lose nothing, worry about nothing. Jesus' death wasn't there to free us simply from dying, but to free us from the fear of dying. Jesus came to liberate us so that we would die up front and then live. Jesus Christ wants to take us to places where only dead men and women can go. But I wonder how many of us have lost our barbarian way, have become embittered with God, confused about our faith, because God doesn't come through the way we think he should come through. Maybe a part of the, the energetic power of, of the church is lost because we keep inviting people to step into the comfort and safety and security of Jesus Christ. We keep telling that Jesus is going to bless you and bless you and bless you and give you more and more and more and just absolutely take care of you in all the ways that you want in your materialistic, self-centered, egocentric self. And maybe we need to step back and say, you know, really, it's not about you. Jesus Christ is worth dying for. He wants you to throw yourself at his feet. And if it means a life of suffering and hardship and disappointment, it is worth it because it is more powerful, more fulfilling to follow Jesus Christ than to live a life with everything in this world without Christ. Have we forgotten that? Have we lost our barbarian way out of civilization? You know, when September 11th took place, I was on my way to the airport. And I obviously didn't get to take off that day. Went back home, we spent the day just trying to serve people and help people, and I forgot to process my children, my son Aaron, my daughter Mariah. And the next morning, Kim said, you've got to talk to the kids. So I sat them down, and I thought, what am I going to tell them? You know, I want to tell them this would never happen to us, that God would always protect us, that as long as you're doing God's will, everything's going to be fine. But all that isn't true. And I remember looking at my children and saying to them, what we've learned yesterday is that you cannot choose when you die or how you die. But we do have is the power to choose how we live. I wonder how many of us are in that place of John the Baptist, at that crucible where God says, are you willing to lose everything on my behalf? Rather than living a long life, are you willing to live a life worth living? The barbarian sees Jesus differently than the civilized Christian, but I want you to see also that the disciples look different when we're barbarians than when we're civilized. It goes on in verse 7, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A, a reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet, yes. I tell you, in more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And a little later, Jesus throws out the dilemma. You know, John came neither eating nor drinking, and you say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and you say that he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Do you realize that from both extremes, no one was satisfied with what a person who was connected to God looked like? I mean, what is Jesus saying about John? What he's telling us is this. That disciples of Jesus Christ look different than you might expect. I mean, how many of us would actually expect John the Baptist and the way he presented himself, wearing animal skin and eating locusts and wandering around in, in the desert, to be the person who prepared the way for Christ? I mean, if he lived today, he would be medicated. <laughs> right? He would be manic depressive or ADD or 
have some kind of social anxiety disorder or, I mean, how many of us really would have John the Baptist speaking at the summit? <laughs> I mean, most of us would think that John is out of his mind. Now, I just stopped and reflect and asked myself this question. If this is what the person looked like who prepared the way for Jesus, then what should a disciple of Jesus Christ look like who comes after Jesus? How is it possible that for many of us, what it means to be a Christian is to be a good citizen? But the entire focus of our Christianity is the elimination of sin, rather than the unleashing of a unique, original, extraordinary, unbelievable, even insane life. John the Baptist would be classified as a madman. He would be classified as insane. And I, I listen to Paul. Paul says, oh, if it, were, if it were just for God, I would be out of my mind. And because of you, I stay in my right mind. But if it were just for God, I'd be out of my mind. But because of you, I stay in my right mind. I'm thinking, Paul, you're schizophrenic. <laughs> I mean, read Romans 7. This man is troubled. <laughs> now, when I was 12 years old, I had my first visit to a psychiatric office. Yes. And you're listening to me right now. <laughs> and you would think that what Jesus does is he, he works toward making you normal. Now there's a difference between healthy and normal. When I read the scriptures, I find a history of people that were driven out of their minds by the living God, the creator of the universe. Now I know something to be true about your life in Christ you have had experiences with God that fall out of your theological understanding. You've had experiences with God that are very barbaric, very primal. They make you uncomfortable. You've had times where God has spoken to you so clearly, so distinctly, that you thought you were losing your mind. I mean, think about it just for a minute. How in the world should we ever look normal? We think we hear God. And I was a Christian just a couple of months up in college, and I, I went to everything because I didn't know a whole lot about Christianity. So I, I went to Catholic Mass, and I went to the Pentecostal Bible study, I, and I went to the Baptist and Methodist the Church of Christ. I mean, I just, just, the whole thing was like a buffet. It was so much fun. It was like tutti frutti. I mean, it was amazing going through everything. And, and in one of these Bible studies, there was a young woman named Len, and she said to me, you know, Irwin, uh, you don't know about my life before Jesus. She was the guitar player, and I used to borrow her guitar, and she said, uh, I used to live with a guy named Kenny, and I, I, I'm going back. I called him up. I, I, I don't feel God anymore. I just don't feel God, and she used to live a life of drugs and all this stuff, and, and I was shocked. I didn't know what to tell her. She goes, I just don't feel God's love, and I know now what to tell her because I've had some practice. I know now I could say Jesus Christ proved his love for you on the cross, but I didn't think of that right then. And so when she said, I just don't feel God's love, I, I said, if there's anything God could do to, to prove his love for you, he would do it. Now, I know better than to say that now. But I said that then, and she looked at me, and she said, well, then I want the snow. And I looked at her, and I thought, see, this is why I don't know how to communicate to women. Because <laughs> it's moments like this that confuse me. And, and it, I thought that confused me. What I said confused me even more. I said, all right, then God's going to make it snow for you. And, and when I said that, I thought, that's not really a good thing to say. And, and so I added, within 24 hours, which I meant it, more than 24, but I said it backwards. And so I gave myself a time limit. And then she said, oh, OK. I don't know why she said, oh, OK. And I, I went back to my dorm room. I, I shut my door. I turned off the lights. I, I pulled down the shades. I got on my face before God. Have you ever just earnestly cried out to God? And I remember crying out to God. I said, God, I, I don't know why I said that. I thought you said that. but I." And, uh, <laughs> And God, but if it wasn't you, could you sort of like adopt the idea and, uh, you know, take this on? And I mean, I was just crying out to God, praying, and, and you know, I mean, I was out of my mind. And, and I fell asleep there. You ever had those prayer marks? You know? And I, I believe in unconscious intercession. I think it counts when you fall asleep on your knees crying out to God. And, don't you? And, and so a few hours went by, my roommate Mark uh, came by, and, and he said, hey, Irwin. Uh, and I said, what? And, and he goes, have you looked outside? And I, I felt he was mocking me. And I thought, oh, no, he knows. <laughs> well, what happened is she went all over campus telling everybody she could see, God's going to make a snow for me because he loves me. Now, I didn't tell her to do that. But you see, you know what my problem was? They had me read the Gospel of John instead of the Gospel of Mark. Because in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said, go and tell no one. 
just that little bit of theological training would have helped me immensely. And, but I didn't, and so I got up, and I walked over to the window after he, I felt he was chastising me to look outside, and I pulled my shade, and I have to tell you, there's snow everywhere. Now, I can't explain it. I don't know what happened, but I, I'm, you know what I knew? I knew it the whole time. And I, I took <laughs> off. I ran down the stairs. The one outside found her. She did not go back to her old life, and I, then I went back and got involved in seminary, and I learned God doesn't speak like that. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. Because, <laughs> you see, I was a barbarian, and if I had just been civilized soon enough, I could have ignored the voice of God. And I, I, I could have reinterpreted all the passages where it says, if you hear his voice. But and it said, oh, that doesn't really mean that. I could have ignored Hebrews where it says, when God speaks, you need to obey. Because if you don't obey, your heart becomes hard and your ears become dull of hearing. And his voice becomes distant to you. We are not normal we are barbarians. We are savages. We go to the primal place and we enter into the presence of the Most High God and we are changed by his presence. And I've thought about this. We've been, I, I loved yesterday. It was amazing. And in fact, as I listened yesterday, I had the thought, man, I guess I am the, the conference savage. <laughs> but then I saw it. God showed it to me in a dream. I saw it. Bill Hybels, <laughs> you taught us this amazing stuff yesterday after all these decades of leadership, but you started this church when you were 23. You were a punk kid. You didn't know anything. <laughs> he was like us. <laughs> but somehow he could hear the rumbling in the earth and feel the wind of the Spirit blowing against his face and he could smell the aroma, the fragrance, the presence of God. And a 23-year-old punk kid could move into God's future and do something so extraordinary that only, it could only be explained because underneath those pleated pants and that great suntan, you are a barbarian. <laughs> I know I'm not finished, but I know I'm done. <laughs> but I ought to just go ahead and finish the passage. Just verses 11 and 12. See, the barbarian sees Jesus differently than the civilized Christian. The barbarian understands that disciples look different than civilized disciples. The barbarian knows that the mission of Christ is different than the civilized version of the mission. In verses 11 and 12 says, I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's us. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. Other translations say violently advancing. Now, I know that that's not PC, but it's there. The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men and women lay hold of it. Jesus is saying, as we are in a war, and those of us who have been Entrusted the privilege to lead in the kingdom of God cannot live our lives in the material world. We, we cannot limit our sights to that which is flesh and blood. We know better than that. We understand that there is an unseen battle among invisible kingdoms. And that people's lives are forever changed by what happens in the invisible we are called by God to be warriors of light, as Pablo Coelho says, and, of course, the Apostle Paul. We are called to be barbarians for Christ who walk into the dark with a primal fire and understand that just past the light 
In the darkness there is mystery and uncertainty and yes, even evil. But we advance for the light we bring is the only hope the world will ever have. The kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing. The church is to be an unstoppable force. I was asked when I wrote my first book, um, would you explain what the issues in culture are that are causing the church to be plateaued and causing the church to decline? It irritated me. And so I sent a chapter back called Atrophy, which said, there is no problem in the world stopping the church. All the problems that are stopping the church are inside, not outside. Now, I know that's not what they wanted, but that's what I sent. And then I repented. <laughs> and I sent the next chapter called Friction Traction. Because I said, okay, okay, what are the things in the world stopping us? And I thought, nothing again. So I wrote Friction because there are things that slow us down. But Traction because they speed us up if we move in the barbarian way out of civilization. I love um, taking my kids to places where they experience things and I experience them through their eyes. You know what I'm talking about? We were out in uh, this animal park, and the um, instructor started telling us about animals. It was really cool. And I, I didn't realize that animals had names in groups. Like bees are a swarm, right? Um, the cattle are a herd. Lions are a pride, right? So you have lion prides. Uh, guess what a group of, um, of crows are? Murder. <laughs> guess what a group of buzzards are? A committee. Now, there is my one leadership principle I'm passing on to you this morning. It explains everything. A group of flamingos are flamboyants. Isn't that cool? But my favorite, above all the rest, is a group of rhinos. You see, rhinos can run 30 miles an hour in their tonnage. 30 miles an hour with that horn. But they can only see 30 feet in front of them. <laughs> so you know what they're called? They're a crash. I love that. That's what I want to be. Because anyone who says they can see 20 years in the future is just lying. The future is uncertain. The future is there to be created. We need to move together as God's people like rhinos. 30 miles an hour, even if we could only see 30 feet in front of us. You know why? Because what's at 31 feet doesn't matter to the rhino. It better get out of the way. <laughs> and so my son Aaron, when he was 15, you know, he's 15 now. He was about eight then. We were renting this two-story house in L.A. And I always wondered when he would figure out how to get on the roof on the second floor. Because I thought I'd do that. <laughs> and, and one day he climbed up the sink, worked his way across the, the counter, and he went out the window. And Kim and I were outside. It was in the evening. And he said, Mom, Dad, look, I'm on the roof. I thought, isn't that cute? <laughs> and Kim, my wife who was here with me, she can attached to the story. She said, Aaron, get back inside. And he looked at me. I don't know why he just ignored his mom that moment, but he said, Dad, can I jump? <laughs> Thought about it a moment. I said, yeah, sure, go ahead, jump. And Kim said, well, what do we, no, of course you can't jump. Aaron, you get back inside. And he said, Dad, can I jump? And I said, yeah, you can jump. And Kim said, no, you, you can't jump. Aaron, you get back inside. I said, wait a minute, Aaron, are you going to jump like someday? You're like, well, we're, maybe we're not here. He goes, yeah, I think so. I said, okay, I'd rather have you jump now while we're here, so if you break your legs, we can take you over to the hospital. And <laughs> Kim's like, what are you saying? And <laughs> now, I know you won't invite me to do a parenting conference. I'm okay with that. And, <laughs> and so he said, Dad, do you think, uh, you think I'll make it? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 you'll make it. He <laughs> goes, okay, okay. I'm going to jump. And I said, all right, hey, one suggestion. He said, what's that? I go, try to clear the concrete. <laughs> he goes, oh, OK, that's a good idea, Dad. And I said, yeah, the grass is softer. And so he stepped back. He got ready to jump. He goes, hey, Dad, will you catch me? I said, I'll try. Is you're going to catch me? He said, I'll try. And 
said, all right, I'm coming. He took off and he jumped. And I almost caught him. <laughs> it was so close, right there. <laughs> and he's okay now. <laughs> and he was okay then. And I've had this image in my mind ever since. We've been telling men and women and children who are followers of Jesus Christ, you, you, you climb back in the window. God just wants you to stay in the safe place. And it might just be possible that we have a father who knows, hey, this is a jump you need to take. And inside of our souls... It's maddening, it drives us insane. We can't explain it. It goes beyond the rational, the, the natural, the normal. But God wakes you up saying to you, you can make a difference. You can mark human history. You can be a part of changing the eternity of men and women around the world. I'm on the board of uh, intercultural studies at Biola. I don't know why. I never go. But, but one day I, I showed up and usually if it's an all-day meeting I said which hour do you want me and they said well we'll take the early one or the one in the afternoon so I came and they, they had a presentation from their um, counseling department in Aramore. they said we're going to invest all this money to send counselors around the world to work with our missionaries and that way we can help them have mental health and I was listening, I knew I should remain silent, but I couldn't. It just sort of came out of my mouth once again, and I said, don't do it. They looked at me and all these dignified board members, and I said, don't do it. Don't go around the world and, 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 and make our missionaries mentally healthy. <laughs> you got a man and a wife, they're from, they're from Kentucky. And they have four kids, and they've moved to an obscure city in the middle of Central Asia with two million people who don't speak English, and they don't even speak Mandarin or Cantonese or any form of a Chinese dialect. And they wake up in the morning, and they believe that they're going to see that entire city come to faith in Jesus Christ. You go, and you make them normal, and they're going home tomorrow. Some of us, some of us need to take off our pompous robes of civilized Christianity. We need to stop worrying about what other people say about us. Some of us seem to be called to be gluttons and others seem to be called to be monastics. But what matters is that you're called that you hear the voice of the one who created the cosmos in a word. That you know the one whose presence is undeniable, though he is invisible. That the creator of all the universe, who stands in every place, is in intimate communion with you. And when you wake up in the morning, you hear him whisper inside of your soul, I created you to do something so extraordinary. It's going to blow your mind. It's beyond you, beyond your talent, beyond your abilities, beyond your courage, beyond everything you are and everything you have because it's going to be me and you together. But you've got to find the barbarian way out of civilization. Lord bless you. As I said, he's better than me, right? I'm okay with that. So, we're going to have a little debriefing here. I want to talk about some of the things he said and your thoughts and what you experienced and heard there. And then we'll take a break. And there's... There's cookies, donuts, uh, blueberry cobbler. Is that what it was, Elaine? Coffee cake, blueberry coffee cake. There's uh, clementines. Gorp, all kinds of good stuff, and chocolate caramel brownie coffee. But you gotta wait.
I'd like to talk for a little bit. So before I even talk, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Um, of course, he speaks in hyperbole a little bit. He's, he wrote a book, and he's you know making a point, so uh, he uses some interesting metaphors of being a barbarian and whatnot. But I think there's a lot to be said about what it is that he's saying. And uh, just want to hear, let's riff, let's, let's chat. What did you think? First, did you like it? Yeah, I heard a lot of laughs. He is a compelling communicator, right? He is, at the least, he's entertaining. But I think he's more than just entertaining. Uh, but yeah, so good communicator. What else? I wrote down barbarian Christians in the civilized Christians. Sure, yeah. He kept hitting that point. Yeah. We are not our moment of Exactly. I think that's important. Anyone else? Yeah, you'll remember that for the rest of your life. Go ahead, Donna. Oh, yeah. In the city, it's not going to be the same as yep. So we need to be left by what God wants us to do individually and as a group. And that can be risky. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, for those of you who don't know. So Willow Creek, which is the group that does this conference, um, is a church of about 25 or 30,000 people in a western suburb of Chicago, and in an incredibly affluent suburb of Chicago at that. I've been there for a conference before, and uh, uh, their church building is the size of a football stadium, and their parking lot's like 88 acres. Um, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating there. It, I, I parked at one end, and we had to walk to the other end, and it took like 15 minutes to get to the building. <laughs> it was, I was like, wow, that's a long ways away from here. Uh, but they fill it up multiple times on a weekend. And uh, praise God that they're, they're doing that. But not my style of church, but they're doing some good things. And in spite of, if you know their background, uh, their founding pastor, Bill Hybels, who they were referencing, um, has been removed from ministry in the last year uh, with some real, real issues of how he treated people, how uh, some ongoing issues with relationships with women and some other stuff. So... Uh, sad story there, but that doesn't change the fact that that church has done a lot in the Chicago area to uh, advance the gospel, and and uh, one individual pastor's uh, mistakes won't won't change uh, 40 years of, of good ministry there. So um, don't don't lose the lose the vision because of his mess there. I guess is all I would say, and that's unrelated. But and then the other thing is, so Irma McManus, um, his church. If you're not familiar with Mosaic, most people are not. Uh, is a church, and, and they meet in a couple of different sites. It's a, it's a church of thousands of people now at this point, but at that point, his church was probably maybe 1,000 or 1,500 people, which in the scheme of things for the people who tend to speak at that conference was a small church. Um, not by any means a small church, don't hear that. But uh, he, he ministers at the time in a place called The Lion. The Lion was a, uh, a nightclub in downtown Los Angeles, and his church met on Sunday nights when the bar wasn't open because nobody was coming to the bar on Sunday night. So they literally met in this giant disco dance party nightclub is where their church met for like the first 20 years of that church. And so you'd come in and, and that, uh, I think it's called the Lion or something like that. But the motif decoration of that club was Mayan. And so the entire place was covered with Mayan gods. And so you'd walk in and there'd be all these false gods everywhere inside of this church. And it was a bar, you know, they have the bar kind of walled off so you couldn't go buy a drink. But it was there, and, you, you know, if you were there on Saturday night, you knew, you knew what it was. Um, so interesting, interesting uh, ministry that he's had there in Los Angeles. Um, any other thoughts? Go. Absolutely, yeah. You kind of got to that at there, there towards the end. David. I think a lot of times, if you're a civilized Christian, you don't uh, feel comfortable with uh, well, you, you see an opportunity for you to do this. You may say, well, I don't know what that person is. You know, you don't 
Did your hand go up? Or you're just moving. Okay. Anyone else? These are all good. So, if you were paying attention to the way he presented all of this, there 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 was a, there was an intentionality, I think, to his process that he showed. He was modeling something. If you remember, the very first thing is he told a story, right? Uh, this is something I would encourage you to learn to do. And so, the most powerful presentation of the gospel is simply tell your story. Because that can't be refuted. Somebody might argue with you about something else. They can't argue with you about your story. Right? And people like to hear stories and people like to tell stories. And so, if you're uncomfortable communicating... The gospel, if you don't feel like David is saying, I don't know all those verses. Okay, you don't have to necessarily. You can get there. You can write all those down. You can, you can, you know, on the inside front of your Bible, write down a list of verses to share with somebody. Or you could have a, you could print out the Romans Road if you would like, or, or whatever tool it is you might like. A Romans Road is, I think, Bill Bright from Evangelism Explosion, if you remember that out of the late 70s, early 80s is when that kind of took off and, and, and really became kind of the, the language of evangelicalism. And, and it was, was a good system. I'm not knocking it anyway. Uh, a very good system. Um, people have kind of moved to some other things now, but the, I, I still find that to be a very, very powerful way of, of sharing faith. And so, you know, tell your story. Know what your story is. Uh, know it well enough, know your own story, that you can modify it for the setting and context. Sometimes you've only got a few minutes. Sometimes, you, you know, you've got an hour to sit with somebody and talk with them. Well, you're going to tell the story a little bit differently. It's not a different story, but you're going to tell it differently because of the time. And then you have to be able to read the person and, and what might their interests be. You know, when I talk with a high school football player, I'm going to talk more about that and in my background playing football and, and how that through a number of channels, partially, partially helped me come to faith, I'll focus on that. But that doesn't connect with a lot of people who never played football. So I, I don't bring that up when I'm talking with somebody else necessarily. I, I use other parts of my story. And, and telling your story and just communicating that can communicate the gospel because if they can see the change in you, they can see the power of God. And, and so I, I allude to my story occasionally um, and tell bits and pieces of it, and many of you have heard chunks of it in a sermon, and uh, I, I don't want to go through all of that today, but but it, it's little pieces of it are going to come in to play as we go out through the day today, because it helps you connect to me, but I also want to model for you how to go about doing this. And so I think as he was starting the story, as he was preaching there, he said, you know, I, I'm Ecuadorian, grew up Catholic Hindu, or whatever you want to call it, and uh, was, was kind of a mess, went to college, became a philosophy student. He, like me, did not become a Christian until later in life. He was already in college when he became a Christian. Uh, same, same in my story. And so he, he's trying to make a connection there. He's trying to draw you in. And once you have that listener kind of leaning forward, you know you've got him. You don't, you don't got them to bring them across, you know, to the cross, but you've got them that they are now willing to listen to you at least. And so I think we need to learn to start with a story and, and practice your story. Um, tell, just work at it. The only way you get better at telling a story is to tell it and tell it and tell it. Uh, you know, when I get up here and preach on a Sunday morning, that's not the first time I've ever thought through the words I was going to say to you. I, I work at it. I I write it out, I, I cut words out, I change words, I try to wordsmith, I try to make things sound better. Not because I want to impress you because of me. No, I want to leave an impression on you because of God. And, and it's not about me. And if it becomes about me, I, I need to step away. Because that's not what it's about. 
Um, but practice, as we say, doesn't make perfect, but it does make you better, right? And we've been talking, my son and my family and I, we talk a lot about this because, you know, Justice is nine now, he's in fourth grade, and, and he's at that point where he's beginning to decide some of the things that he's going to do for the rest of his life, right? So if he wants to be a drummer, this is the age where he's probably going to start drumming. Or if he wants to play basketball, well, these are kind of those formulative years where if he's going to play basketball, we're probably going to have to start spending more time standing in the driveway shooting baskets, right? And, and so I repeat to him on a pretty regular basis, I say, buddy, you know, you, you can be whatever you want to be. I, I'm not telling you if you want to be a golfer or a tennis player, you know, it's all before you, whatever you want, whatever you enjoy, we'll, we'll figure it out and make it happen. But here's the thing you need to know. It takes commitment if you want to be good at something. And, and one of the things is he likes to run. He's a good runner. And so we just had a conversation the other day. I said, buddy, would you like to, they're going to do a running program at the school, at the elementary school. I said, would you like to go run with Mrs. Sension and Mrs. Williams? They're going to have kids and they're going to do some running and have a running kind of club. Well, I don't know, Dad. I said, well, you talk about being, you know, this good runner and you want to be a fast runner and you want to be the best runner. It's going to take some practice. Oh, yeah, I suppose. I said, you know, and it might, you're going to be tired and hot and sweaty and there's going to be days you aren't going to want to run. But I said, if you keep running, you'll keep getting better. Yeah, I know. I said, well, would you be interested in maybe running with these guys? Well, I think so. Let me think about it. I'm, okay. So I kind of left it there for now. He's got to sign up here fairly soon. But I think he's going to go and join this, this running club, um, which is great. Uh, hopefully he'll find something there he likes. But the point is, and the thing that we talk about frequently, is this idea that it's, He's coming into this age that what you repeat and what you practice is what you're going to get better at. Um, it's not by accident that somebody's good at something. I mean, yes, we're all gifted. So maybe Gary's a very gifted evangelist. Okay, great. But if he doesn't do anything with the tools that he's been given, those tools are dull and not effective. Somebody else might not be an effective evangelist by gifting, but maybe they, they go out and they still every week go out and they're spending time every week witnessing to people. They're going to be better at it than the guy who was equipped by God, but never used it. And so we have to be intentional. We have to have a plan. We have to, we have to do it and do it and do it. And if we fail, we get up and we do it again. Uh, that's one of the important things in life. You know, the old adage, if you get knocked off a horse, right, you got to get back on it right away. And uh, the same is with evangelism. Now, as we talk about these things, and today, as I said, it's going to be pretty evangelism-focused. Um, not just evangelism. We've got other stuff, too. But as, as we think about evangelism and as we do that and as you maybe have a failure, I want to remind you, however, I don't think we ever fail in evangelism. You know, in life, there's a scoreboard. You win, you lose. There's a score at the end of the day. It's not the same in evangelism. Evangelism is much more like farming, Matt could tell you, you know, you're, you're casting seeds. Now, if Matt were to go out and hand cast seed, if he didn't till the soil, and he just threw them out among whatever was already in the field, some of it's going to grow, right? Some seeds are going to take root. But if he cultivates it, if he works it, turns that soil over, he might have to disc it, he might have to you know, spread manure on it and all the other things. More stuff about farming than I probably should get into because I'll be over my head here shortly. But all the things that need to be done to prepare his fields. Now he goes out with a planter and it plants a seed at the exact depth, the right distance apart from one another. Much, much higher success. Still, some of those seeds won't grow though. Um, it still happens. It's not 100%. He had a bad seed. You planted on a rock, stupid squirrel, whatever, you know? All sorts of things can happen. And uh, with that, the encouragement there is to be faithful. The, the scoreboard isn't, it, this isn't a light switch when it comes to evangelism. It's not off or on. It's not, it's not succeed or failure. This is, you are investing. This is, you are watering. But... All we can do is water. We cannot make anything grow. That's for the Holy Spirit and God to do. And so if you've had an encounter in your past, maybe where you tried to share with somebody and it didn't work, and now that's created some fear in you, I want to encourage you that don't see that as the end game. Because 
you were investing in that person. If they didn't come to faith, you were just maybe preparing for the next person who comes. You were watering the seed. You're not growing it. And so we have to keep that in mind and, and frame our evangelism. Now, yes, we want to work hard at evangelism. Yes, we want to get good at evangelism. Yes, we want to seal the deal, get them to cross that line, sign the dotted line, come to Jesus. We want that. But it's not always going to be the case. And so you need to have the encouragement. You need to have the knowledge and the understanding that it is a process. And for some people, right there, they're ready. For other people, it might take 20 years. But be faithful. And if you're faithful, God will honor that. And honor it through you. Whether or not that person ever comes to faith, if you have done your part, that's what matters. And so, just want to encourage you in that, to keep at it. And then the other thing is, and, and as he was talking about the barbarian way, I think it's important to understand there is a cost. Okay? If we're going to live out our faith, if we're going to be biblical Christians, if we're going to understand... One of the last things Jesus communicated to us, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right? Go. It's an imperative. You've all heard lots of sermons about it. I don't need to bludgeon you with it. But it's to go. To go and make disciples. To go. There's no, there's, there's, there's no ambiguity. There's no other option. Just to Go. And if we're going to live those things out, and there's a bunch of other things in the Bible about this, if we're going to actually be people of faith, we're going to see resistance. Okay? We're going to see resistance from the world first. Because they're going to look at us and go, you're weird. Well, yeah, we're aliens, right? We are aliens. That's what the Bible tells us. This is not our home. And so we are going to look a little bit different. If I was born in Ecuador or Mexico or the Ukraine or somewhere else, I might naturally feel like an alien here. It's easy for me to take that for granted. I was born in the Midwest, you know. I speak Scandahoovian. Oh, yeah. We all say, Ope. oh, sorry, right? Did you know, oh? But we all say it. Tell somebody points out that you say, oh, you probably don't realize you say, oh, but we all say, oh, right? Does anybody not say, oh? We have no ope people? Come on. I, it, it, you know, I'd been using it, I, I bet you I'd used it for 30 years of my life without realizing it until I read an article about the word ope. And I was like, ope, I say that. <laughs> I didn't even realize, it was just so much part of our language that we say ope, O-P-E, ope. It's not really a word. But in the Midwest, and especially the upper Midwest where we live, we say ope. Like, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, I was in your way. I don't even know its root. I don't know where it comes from, but it's in our language. Anyhow, um, it's easy because we, most of us, grew up here, lived here all of our lives, to be enculturated. And especially if you live in a small town like this, where maybe you're still surrounded by all the people you grew up with, and your family doesn't live too far away, and it's easy to be in a comfort zone. But even within that, there still is going to be resistance. Um, because you're going to look different if you are really living out the Bible. Now, I have found, at least in our culture, that as I live out my faith more faithfully, people are actually more inquisitive than they are resistant. Because they're like, well, why, why did you behave that way? Why did you act that way? Why did you treat me in a different way than I was expecting? You didn't yell back at me, or you didn't swing back at me, or you didn't punish me, or you didn't avoid me, or while I could see you were angry, you forgave me. Why, why did you do that? That's not how people treat people here. Well, that opens up some really powerful windows for conversations about the transformation of Jesus Christ and how he's changed me. And so we can communicate that. And, and so there will be resistance from the world, though. I want you to hear that. And there will be times where being a Christian might make you feel uncomfortable. And you have to be okay with that, frankly. There, there is a price to being an alien, to being different. 
We have to, at some point, come to terms with that and accept it. But here's the thing that I've found, and I wish it wasn't true, but I know that it is. If we do this, there's other Christians who will also offer resistance. When we live out the Bible, when we say faithful is the true teachings of the Word of God, it makes other people, in, even maybe in our church, but outside of our church for sure, uncomfortable. I've encountered this. Oh, you go to that Bible thumping church. Isn't every church supposed to be Bible thumping? Uh, I'm confused. But they're not. And that... And no way do I want to hear anybody say, Pastor Chris said these guys are bad guys. That's not what I'm saying. There's Bible-believing Christians and lost people in probably every church in America. So that's not a point of pride that, oh, we've got it right and they've got it wrong. Ah, that's not what you're hearing. No, we're all a mess. But I have experienced within the church and within churches and within ministry between churches that if you really begin faithfully working through some of these things, if you create a culture of people sharing the gospel, if you are actually out in the neighborhood serving people, loving people, if you're reaching the marginalized, if you're helping the poor, if you're loving the lost, there's other people who will look at you and go, "Ah, I don't know if you should be doing that. There's a pretty good biblical precedence from that, right? Um, It happened at the time of Jesus too. And he alluded to it. Oh, you, you hang out with the prostitutes and the drunks. Yeah, they, they need to hear the gospel. They do. So we're trying to reach them. I think about this every Wednesday night. We've had, for whatever reason, some rough kids come through our youth group. And uh, I don't need to give you any of their backgrounds. You just need to know some of those kids come from broken families for generations abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, drugs, alcohol, there's all kinds of bad stuff going on in their lives. And yet, they don't go to church anywhere, but they're faithfully here every Wednesday night. And I have no idea what God can do with that. But I want to be faithful with it. And and I'm going to keep, you know, inviting people to come and serve them food. You know, we have some great, great people who cook, serve, clean, without any recognition other than maybe an occasional thanks. You may never know what that does, though, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Because, see, we're we're, we're running the race, right? But the race isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. We have to run with endurance. And so we play the game in the long game. We're looking towards the future. We're working in the now, but we're looking towards the future. And we have to keep investing. We have to keep inviting. We have to keep creating opportunities where people can hear the gospel. We have to just keep doing these things again and again unapologetically, knowing that there will be resistance. But we're willing to pay that price. And that's why I said, you'll you'll either get on board with me eventually or you'll fire me. One of the two will happen. (laughs) the way things go, unfortunately. And I I don't fear any firing, so I'm not worried about that at this point. But, But that is something we have to be aware of. That as you do this, it might alienate you from some people who you thought were Christian. And that is the price to be paid, and you have to be okay with that. You don't have to be okay that they're not on board. I think you can invite them on your journey as well. I think that sometimes creates great opportunities and people go, whoa, Gary, why do you go to the prison to talk to these losers, these dirtbags, these scum of the earth, right? These addicts, thieves. <laughs> you can comment if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. I'll give you it. Can you all hear him? Otherwise, I can get him a mic. I'll try to speak up. Do you, you want a mic? We'll give you a mic. But it's, it's wireless. You can walk around. 
white one? Okay. I didn't ask him to speak, so the Holy no. Spirit must be convicting you. Well, yeah, I hold it close so, I, so you don't see me shake too much. Now, there's some things that are really, in my mind, they're really important. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the jail. And I can tell you that uh, it was never my intent to spend any time there. And I was, I was invited to go there and, uh, by John Fremling, if you knew him. And a lot of people did. And uh, this was a forerunner of joining the Gideons, of which I didn't know anything about, except that when I was a kid, they gave me a Bible. But uh, he said, uh, well, I guess I back up just a little bit and say, we moved from Iowa up here, and we fulfilled the dream of coming to Minnesota and living on the farm. That was always the thing. And I would hunt and fish and and do all the things that I like to do in the outdoors. We come from a church where I served 21 years and had about every job in it and and enjoyed everything about it. Hated to leave that family. And uh, I, I mean it... If you got that kind of a family, and some of you do here, it, 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 it can kind of tear your heart out a little bit. But we come up here, and, uh, and one of the things I said, uh, I was praying, and I said, Lord, I says, you know, over the years, I've done a lot of things. You've enabled me to do a lot of things that I didn't want to do. And yet you supported me. But there's, if there's something, I says, I don't want to volunteer up here. I'm getting tired. I'm retired from my job. Uh, I don't want to quit. Christians never get retired. And, and, he, and uh, I said, I need a door to open if there's something you really want me to do. Otherwise... I'm going to be retired for a while. And you know what? It was only the next day that I got a call from John Fremling. And he says, hey, Gary, you want to go to the jail? And I says, what do you mean go to the jail? Uh, and he says, uh, we're, we'll, we'll talk to him. I know the scripture. Visit the people in the jail. Visit the people that are in prisons. The words speak out. They'll come back and haunt your memory if you read it. And I said, I don't know, John. I said, well, do they lock the doors? And he says, oh, yeah. He says, when you get in there, you can't get out. I said, I don't know about that. And so he says, well, you think about it. And I says, I don't really think it's for me. Hung up the, hung up the phone. Thought about it. Word kept coming back. You're the one that asked for the door to open. You're the one that asked for something. And I just, I thought, you know, Lord, you know, Lord I, I didn't memorize scripture. Yes, I read the Bible. So I've read it several of them through several times. I can't quote scripture. I'm not the person you want in there that can talk to them people and maybe encourage them or even sell them on the idea of being a Christian. But I wrestled with that. I wrestled with it for a day or two. Pretty soon I get another call. Well, what about Monday? Well, yeah, I'll try one Monday. So I did. When in jail, we tried for we tried to Monday, and uh, and we always debriefed it to Dairy Queen uh, over a Sunday, and uh, so that's the way that's the way that started. And he said, "What do you think?" 
And I says, well, I don't like the idea of locking six doors behind me when I go in there. And I can't get out. And uh, he says, well, you, you can probably get used to that. And he says, what about next week? I says, ah, I've got to think about that. I don't, I don't think so. Come next week, he called me again. I'll try one more week. Well, I'll cut the story a little bit shorter and just say, after the third week, I was hooked because I did one thing that Pastor Chris said. I found out that all I had to do was tell my story. And you know what? And when I look at them today, and when I'm in there, yeah, sometimes I, I say, you know what? I got a story, and I can tell them a little bit about it. But I can look them in the eye and say, you know what? You got a story, too. Pretty soon I got somebody a little eager to share their story. And when their story comes out, it's so amazing how things that are in the Scripture kind of leap out. And I didn't have it memorized, but I had a pretty good idea where to go in the Bible to find it. And then we could talk about it. And that's, that's the way it's been for working on 21 years here. And uh, I, every, every now and then I feel short. Uh, sometimes I'm tired. I'd sooner take a beating than go in there. And you say, how, can you, how do you even dare think about it that way? And I said, well, if you work all day, and I got other things that I do, but yet when I go in there and my wife encourages me, when I come out, I'm as high as a kite. You couldn't give me a drug that would make me feel better. And so you keep doing it. And the high points, do you have, do you have people come back? Yeah, you do. But I'll tell you what, it's so nice when they leave, that when they say, I am so glad you come. You don't, you don't tell it the way I hear it on the TV. You don't tell it the way I, I see things play out. You, you just, you're different. I said, well, I don't know about that. I can't explain that. All I can explain is... Uh, if you love people, and that's the prime consideration. Yeah, I know Christians are supposed to. But I know that deep down inside, you need to love people for what they are because every one of them's got a story. And their stories are usually pretty interesting. But uh, I didn't come from a background. My background is... You take care of yourself, learn everything you can do. Don't depend on anybody else. If you've got to do something, do it yourself. And, uh, and just take care of me. Well, all i got to say is, God took care of that. I guess if I prayed for any one thing for anyone in the church, that you would become a people lover. Jesus said... You got to be a people lover. He was one. And if you love people, sometimes all it takes is to walk up to somebody and hi, I'm so and so. And do I get afraid? Do I have fear? You bet. You bet. You turn me loose in a bunch of people that I don't know, and I can't say all your names either. But I'll tell you what. I hope the one. You get done meeting me, or if you see me, I hope I've smiled. I don't always carry one. But I hope you know that, that I love people as Christ loved them. And I can't, I can't begin to know somebody unless I know their story. And so, tell me your story, but I'll tell you what. Everything this guy says is right on line. But the biggest thing that held me up was I love children that can memorize. And we've, we've been in churches and, and helped kids do Bible study, Bible memorization. I don't take any of that away. For me, it has had to be, it just had to be a situation of 
keep reading and keep reading. One of the things that I like to do is get a new Bible. I used to say I'd do it every year and just start reading it through and underline everything I thought it was important. Well, I can't say I got only about three or four Bibles right now. But one, the last one was a chronological Bible. I want to see how did everything happen in chronological sequence. I don't want to read the same thing two or three times in a row. Blah, 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 and that sort of thing. And, and so I did that. But if you keep reading something over and over, no matter how bad you are at memorization, for some reason, God seems to put some things into your brain that will come back and help you out. I'm done. You got more than you asked for. Appreciate that, Gary. As I said, I didn't ask Gary to speak, and that was off, off the cuff. And uh, I know, like he said, he's not always comfortable speaking, and, and uh, so appreciate it. A couple other things, and then we're going to take a break. Um, there will be a cost. There will be resistance, both from the world, but also from within those you thought were on our team. There is friendly fire, and that does happen. Um, and just expect it. That's all I can tell you. When it comes, don't be surprised. A couple other things that he said that I just want to highlight really quick, but it was mentioned. Um, there is a difference between healthy and normal. We're never called to be normal. I don't want to be normal. Normal's boring. I want to be abnormal. And I hope you do too. I want to be different. I want to look different. I want to behave different. Not because, again, it's about me. It's not about me. It's about the trans transformation that's happened within me from Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit from God the Father. That is why I want to be different. But along with that, we also all have to remember I'm not who I want to be, but I'm certainly not who I was. And so part of your story sometimes has to include that. And that's part of my story. Uh, I've told this part of my story, but many of you have probably heard it, but I'll, I'll give you a very quick synopsis example. Um, I've mentioned this in a number of sermons. But uh, I was at my 20-something or another high school reunion, 20th, 25th, I don't know, whatever it was. I'm getting older slowly. But... Uh, this was a while ago. It wasn't recent. <laughs> so I was at my reunion. And uh, my wife has only ever known me since I was in seminary and only known me as a Christian and only known me as a pastor. She didn't know me before. And uh, so we're sitting at a table and one of my high school classmates owns now four bars and restaurants in the Sioux Falls metropolitan area. And so Mark, a uh, very generous guy, hosted the party provided all the food and all the, be all the beverages, booze, everything from his restaurants for free. Very generous. I mean, this was in the many thousands of dollars, I'm sure. And so this is at like 12.30 at night and with an open bar with my high school classmates, probably similar to yours. You can imagine, uh, you know, a few drinks had been had by a number of people. And so we're sitting around a table with like 14, 15 of my classmates, a couple of big uh, eight-footer folding tables have been pushed together and and as occasionally happens in conversation, there's that lull. Where all of a sudden, just like, it's quiet. And nobody's talking and nobody's saying anything. And it's like, everybody just kind of stopped. And so I took that opportunity once it got really quiet. And we're out in the sitting in the garage. I said, uh, I said, hey guys, I got a question for you. Since my wife doesn't know most of you and didn't know me before, you know, you all know I'm a pastor at this point because I had already announced that. And most of them are friends of mine on Facebook or whatever. They know it. I said, but here's the deal. I said, she's only known me as a Christian. She's only ever known me as a pastor. I said, but of all the people you went to high school with, who would have been the last person you would have ever picked to someday be a pastor? And every single finger pointed at me from that whole table. I was the last person anybody ever would have believed, particularly kids who were in my Sunday school class. They would attest, that kid's never going to come to Jesus. <laughs> I, was, I was the kid that was passed from year to year, both in school and Sunday school, with, thank God he's gone. 
<laughs> I was that child, and I could tell you stories. I don't tell these stories in front of children because I don't want to give them ideas. That's the kid I was, right? I was that kid, and much to the horror of my parents. But they were faithful, and they always made sure I was at church. And the idea is, though, that we want to be healthy, not normal. And that will take some intentionality. And we have to be okay that we're going to look abnormal. We have to be at peace with that. And that's going to sometimes tie in with what I was saying before and alienate us at times, but that's okay because if we're honoring God, if we are living out our faith, it'll all fall into place. Don't worry about it. The last two things I want to point out just from his session there was that you can make a difference, that truly you can change the world. There wasn't some miraculous thing that brought me to faith. I don't have some like amazing faith story of God doing something unexpectedly. My faith story is just a bunch of guys in my dorm room who were gracious and wouldn't leave me alone. And they were faithful. And they didn't quit. When I was a jerk, they loved me. When I was coarse and vulgar, they loved me and forgave me. When I was unpleasant towards them, they didn't respond in kind. And pretty soon I began to notice. And eventually that led to the preparation of my heart from all of that to me receiving the gospel. I'd heard the gospel all my life. I grew up in the church. It wasn't a matter of exposure. I just wasn't ready. And eventually God got me to that place. And the same is true for you. You can make a difference. Sometimes, like I said, you've got to have the vision of the long game. And you might be praying for your grandkids for 20, 30, 40 years. Keep praying. Don't be discouraged. Because you can change the world. Keep at it. Keep working. Don't give up. It's the old you know, picture of the frog being swallowed by the bird. He's got his hands on the throat, right? Don't give up. That's sometimes how we have to live as Christians. And then the final thing, and I alluded to this already, but he mentioned it towards the very end of the conversation there. Everyone is called. If you are a Christian, and I at times make that assumption within this church, because we have a lot of what I would call mature Christians here, people who've read the Bible, people who have been in faith for a long time, people who understand and could articulate the gospel. Not everybody can, but a lot of people in this church can. And if that is who you are, whether or not you're living it out currently, you know at some level you are called. We are all called to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. And so whatever the context, whatever the setting, you know, where, where Sandy is called is different than where Matt is called. But we are called. We're all called. And we will all be presented opportunities. And so be faithful in those. Be bold in those. And if you stumble, if you say the wrong words, remember it. <laughs> remember every time. It's not dependent on you. It's the Holy Spirit. You can say the absolute wrong thing, like he was saying about the snow, right? God can use it anyhow. Don't promise people snow except for today, okay? <laughs> if that chance conversation comes up somehow in the next four or five hours, go ahead and tell them God will snow for you. After that, you probably shouldn't. Okay, well with that, do we have any other thoughts and comments? Otherwise, I'm going to set you free for about 10 minutes to go get some, some refreshment as well as to have some conversation with one another. I want you to connect. If there's somebody in the room, you don't know their name, go say hi. Make a connection this morning. Be intentional. Donna. Sure. Yes, yes. Yes, if you don't know Donna, Donna's teaching our adult Sunday school class right now. She's doing a fabulous job. We've been blessed by that and truly are thankful. And if, if more of you want to tell your story to her than can today, she works at the library. You can go meet her there and set up an appointment, take her out to lunch, buy her lunch, and tell her your story. Right? She'll, she'll free lunch. Donna, you take a free lunch? Okay, she'll take a free lunch. If you will buy her lunch, she'll let you tell her your story. Anyhow, with that, go get some coffee and some treats. Uh, let's come back in here at 11.10. Um, one of the things that he cites 
and, and I believe there's empirical data to back this up, is that healthy churches have an average rate of about 10% of conversion growth. Um, when I came here, and this was even more so true in my last church, and this is never meant as a criticism, one of the things you come in with an outsider is an outsider's perspective, and you can see things that the insiders who've become comfortable and used to things don't always see. And one of the things when I came is I, I definitely saw an opportunity for us to be more evangelistic, for us to be more outwardly focused, for us just to be more involved outside of the four walls of our church. And, and we immediately started doing some of those things. If you remember, we went and served lunch at the elementary school to all of the school teachers during conferences, right? And, and just went and loved on them. And we started doing some neat things through our, our missions. Uh, we, we've gone in and, you know, people don't know these things because that's not what it's about. But we've gone in and paid for kids' accounts on lunches whose families are behind because mom or dad had a major medical illness or perhaps died from cancer or something. And they were hundreds, if not more, behind on their accounts. And we've just gone in and, and made those square. Um, and, and just doing some things like that. And I don't say that I don't want any accolades for that. That's not what it's about. We've been blessed, so we need to bless. Um, but we, we've started doing some of those things, and we've started creating some, some additional, because there was some already. I, I don't in any way want to say there wasn't. But starting to create some additional avenues of outflow, where our love goes out and encounters those around us. And we're going to keep on doing that and cre keep creating opportunities for that. Sometimes that does mean bringing people here. The, the Glory Family Christmas is kind of part of that, where, where we open our doors and try to put our best foot forward and invite people in and to have a comfortable experience at a church they might not otherwise tread across and, and visit. Go ahead. Healthy Christian churches, growing, thriving Christian churches, on average, have about a 10% conversion rate. So ha about 10% of whatever the size of that church is are people who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and while it's not an exact, baptisms are often a good reflection of that in a church of our style. So we had 15 baptisms last year, and I think we can have some more this year. And that was a lot of fun, right? We had an amazing August where we baptized 15 people. Um, I rejoice in that. that. That will be a highlight day of all of my life. I, I promise. I will never forget that day. And uh, I've got videos and photos and all of that, but it's also seared in my brain. I will remember those, those people, every one of them. And so, and I love that, and I want to celebrate that, and I want to do that again. Uh, 15 is just the beginning, you know. And then it's, again, it's not about numbers. If we baptize two people this year, praise the Lord. You know, that's, it's not about numbers, but it is a little bit about numbers because each number represents a person and people matter to God. And so, so we do want to be intentional about continuing to connect with people. We will let the Holy Spirit guide whether it's 15, 10, or 50. That's up to God. But we're going to be faithful and keep pushing and keep doing what we're doing and keep creating opportunities and keep, I'm going to keep speaking about it and I'm going to keep sneaking in evangelistic terms and ideas and sermons that aren't even evangelistic because... I want to keep your evangelism temperature high. I don't want that to cool off. Uh, I want you to, to have a hot, white-hot passion and love for Jesus and in love for people, as Gary was talking about. And if we do that, the rest will fall into place. We'll figure it out along the way. Um, there's lots of programs that we could use. They'll all get us there. But if we don't have the fire, if we don't have the passion, if we don't care, it doesn't matter what we do. We'll just be dead in the water. So um, that, that leads to kind of the, the first idea that Scott's presentation is about, is about creating an evangelistic environment. And, and within that, there's, there's no magic guarantee at that 10%. If you, I've seen unhealthy churches have 10% conversion rate and then crater and explode or, or split or all kinds of bad things happen. So it's not a guarantee. It's just kind of a, a rule of thumb, so to speak, that it's a generally... Uh, good idea. If, if you're having conversion growth, if people are coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior through the ministry of your church, you're doing something right. You're moving in the right direction. Okay? That, that, that's all. Um, and, and, and within that, as I was kind of talking about, we have to have this heart motivation. Um, it does us no good if we don't love other people. Uh, if our motivation isn't pure, if it's not to love and serve others and to make much of God, 
if it's about how many people can I get, is it another notch on my belt, uh, there's no value in that. Um, that's not what it's about. That's not what Christianity is about. That's not what Jesus taught. It's not about us. You know, I'm not a big fan of his writings, but Rick Warren is very right in the beginning of the Purpose Driven Church where he says, it's not about you. That's the opening line of the book. And if you don't read anything else in that whole book and that's all you take from that book, you took an awful lot out of that book. It's not about you. And sometimes it not being about us means we're going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes it means we're not always going to get our way. Sometimes it means we're going to have to give sacrificially. Now, I know you know these things. As I said, this is a... The people in this room today, I would say, are fairly mature in their Christianity, most of you. That is me making an assumptions. But on the whole, I know many of you, and I know that's true. And so what that means is, and the danger is, and he was talking about it, this barbarian way versus the encultured way, Sometimes we have to break out of that shell and we do have to take some risks and we do have to to push a little bit so that we reset our boundaries. Every one of us, and it's different for each one of us, we have a a circle imaginary, but we have a boundary around us that's our area of comfort. And for some of us, it's bigger than others. Some people are very comfortable, right? Sometimes we have experiences that shrink or grow that. And whatever your level of comfort is, I believe as a Christ follower, you should be constantly pushing against those and trying to expand that and grow that. So maybe that means you heard Gary speak today and all of a sudden you go, I don't want to go to jail. (laughs) I've spent my life trying not to go to jail. Or maybe I have gone to jail and I don't want to go back. Right? Maybe today God's saying, you know, next Monday you need to go. There's a Monday. Yeah. Next Monday you need to call Gary and say, you know what? I think, how come? Let's see. Okay, awesome. Or, or maybe, you know, it was a few, just, well, probably six, eight weeks ago, Marie said to me after a Bible study one day, hey, do you guys need help on Wednesday night? I'm like, yeah, we'll feed you if you want to hang out. We're not going to turn away help. If you want to go downstairs, they'll let you serve. Just tell them you're here to help. Down she went, and she left at about 8.30 that night looking a lot more tired than when she arrived, but I hope she keeps coming back, so I think she had a good experience with it, right? And uh, sometimes it's as simple as that. Um, I'll tell you a little bit of my story, how God works in mysterious ways. So I'd, I was working for the Boy Scouts of America. God had moved me from Pierre, South Dakota. I lived there for three years, and it was the longest decade of my life. And I moved from Pierre to Mitchell, South Dakota. Don't, don't ever move to Pierre. That's my recommendation. Um, <laughs> not, if you're, not if you're a young single male. It's okay if you're a family and you want to work for the government. It's a great place to live. Safe, clean, and more hunting and fishing than you could imagine. Even more than here, if you can believe that. They live on Lake Oahe. Beautiful, beautiful area. And, and so many geese, literally, you just walk outside and harvest. <laughs> they're, 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 a, they're a nuisance where I used to live. But uh, anyhow, I'd moved to Mitchell, and I'd been going to Northridge Baptist Church, one of our sister churches, for uh, probably about six months. Finally, was really feeling convicted that I was just sponging. I was just taking. And that was on purpose. I, I wanted to get to know the church. I wanted them to get to know me a little bit. And uh, I just was finally reached a point where I was comfortable. I knew that was my church home. So one Monday, I uh, walk into the pastor's office. And it was about this time of year. I go in, and his name is John Tolly. John's a friend of mine now. And I go into John, and... I knock on his door and, yeah, come in. Say, hey, how, how are you doing today, John? Oh, we're doing all right. Okay, well, John, I just wanted to come in and just let you know, you know, I've been here for like six months. You've gotten to know me. I've plugged into some of the Bible studies. You know, you know I work for the Boy Scouts. And if there's something you need, if something I could do, if there's somewhere I could serve, I don't, I don't know what my gifting or skills are, but I can do whatever you need. So if you need somebody to set up chairs for meetings or mow the lawn or anything. It doesn't have to be, I'm not looking to be a Sunday school teacher or anything here, just whatever. So keep me in mind. And, and he was kind of sitting there almost with his head in his hands as, as we were talking. And I could tell he probably wasn't having the greatest of mornings. I didn't know why. And so I, I said this to him and he just kind of looked up at me because I was just standing in the doorway. I didn't like even walk into his office. I just kind of stood in the doorway and just meant to have this very brief conversation on my way to my next meeting because I was working that morning for the Boy Scouts. 
And uh, he looked up at me and he says, funny you should come in today. Now, no great thing has ever come after those words, I suspect. Although this, this was a good thing. But uh, he says, funny you should come in today. He said, he looked at me, we just fired our youth pastor. Like, like, like immediately before I walked in. And his name was also John. He said, Chris, we just fired John, our youth pastor. I'm like, oh, sorry, I didn't know. I would have come some other time. I'll, I'll show myself out, right? You know, I mean, just, uh, I didn't realize you were dealing with something. Apologies. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, I was just sitting here praying before you walked in. I don't know what we're going to do. What are you doing Wednesday night? <laughs> I'm like, well, nothing, I guess. Why? You know, it's like, how would you feel about coming and, and helping out at least for a couple of weeks with the high school and junior high kids? Terrified? He's like, uh, John, you do realize I work with adults. I don't work with kids. <laughs> I work for the Boy Scouts, but I don't do much with kids. I guess I have a teaching degree. But there's a reason I'm not teaching. <laughs> I, I, I work with adults primarily, but I was like, well, I guess, John, if that really is what you need me to do, I, I, sure, I could be a warm body at the very least. He's like, well, we've got Vicki and Brandon, a couple of college kids. They're going to step in and kind of lead the ministry, and then Brandon is now a pastor of a large church in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, really, really neat guy. And his wife is Vicki, so they eventually got married. And a uh, very gifted and equipped couple, and I knew them. And I was like, okay, well, that, that makes me feel a lot better. Because at this point, I really just didn't know the Bible all that well, and I'd never taught the Bible, and I'd never taught kids. Like, well, I taught, you know, student teaching high school students, but it's like junior high kids, they scare me a lot. Um, and okay, I guess if that's where you're calling me, God, I'll do it. I'll be faithful. So sure, John, I'll do that. So he's like, well, I just need to do it for a couple of weeks. Well, after a couple of weeks came, John said, you know, how's it going? It's going better than I expected. Uh, I don't know, you know, if this is for me, uh, but okay. And he said, well, would you, would you be willing to keep doing this until we hire a youth pastor? Yeah, I think I could do that. Okay. And so Vicki and Brandon and I kind of worked everything out. And long story short, that somewhat random, I don't believe in random, God orchestrated Pre-ordained, preordained, predestined, whatever. He had a plan that I had no idea of that he used that, that eventually from that sent me to seminary to here. And God used that. And it's all part of my story. Um, and you just never know by being faithful if God puts that call in your heart, you might resist it for a couple of weeks, right Gary? But if you're faithful and God keeps working at it, you follow through, God can do amazing things. And to God be the glory. Yeah, I, again, I take no credit for any of that story. It's all a God thing. And, and within that, if God is calling you to do something, be faithful. As, as Irwin said, a lot of times we hear that call. No, I, I don't want to hear that call. I don't believe that call. See, here's what happened. I became a Christian when I was 19 in college. When I was graduating from college, God had laid it on my heart that I should probably go to seminary. And that was the craziest thing I had ever heard. There's no way I was ever going to seminary. None. I was like, God, you've lost your mind. You don't know what you're talking about. So God in his graciousness gave me a very good job, sent me to work for the Boy Scouts, and equipped me in amazing ways to go and be a pastor. And created all kinds of opportunities that I never knew gave me all kinds of experiences I had no idea would someday prepare me far better than most pastors ever get to go into seminary. I learned how to raise funds. I learned, I learned how to recruit people. I learned how to have difficult conversations with people. I learned how to remove leaders. Um, you know, that, that can be very tough, but when, when you have to, it's good to have had some experience doing that. Uh, not good, but it's, I've had that experience where I've had to take people out of positions because of Moral failures. Well, when you get to ministry, that happens occasionally too. And so I had no idea God was doing all those things despite my resistance. I was kind of like Jonah. I felt like I didn't know it at the time, but I was running from God's calling on my life. And uh, he had told me I had the conviction at the end of, of college, go to seminary. But that was too much of a leap of faith. 
I'm not a leap of faith kind of guy. I will tell you that. And when God said go to seminary, no, that's not for me, God. I'm going to go over here and do this thing. Well, he used me anyhow. And he eventually got me to seminary, so God wins. Whatever. But, uh, but all that to say, if God is leading, start listening. Um, because the truth of the matter is, we often do harden our hearts. And, and, and you know, you don't want to live with those regrets. As somebody you should have shared with, you know, again, it's not dependent on you. But if God is telling you to do something, go and be faithful in it. If God says, go and love and serve your neighbor, go shovel their sidewalk tomorrow or whatever it takes. You know, even with eight inches of heavy wet snow. Whatever it takes, be faithful. Listen to those and heed those and respond to those. Because it is about the motivation of the heart. We want to love others. We want to invest in others. We want others to know that they are loved. Gary and I were talking about, you know, what are the secrets? What makes one church thrive and another church die? I think one of the keys is if somebody comes through those doors, do they feel loved? If they felt loved, we have a pretty good chance they'll come back again. If they didn't feel loved, if nobody said hi, if nobody welcomed them, if nobody thanked them, if nobody maybe called them that week or sent them a letter or whatever it might have been, well, then they might not come back. And so we all play a part in that, loving people. And so being motivated, Within that, tell your story at every opportunity you get to tell it. Um, and then, of course, let Scripture be the foundation. I'm like Gary. I'm not a gifted Bible memorizer. I, I, I'm not good at memorizing verses. I'm not good at memorizing anything. I can't remember phone numbers. Um, I, I struggle to know my own Social Security number. You know, I, I miss those days where they used to have two, three, and four-digit phone numbers, right? I could probably remember those. But... That doesn't work in the world anymore. But there is something for memorizing Scripture and, and memorizing a specific set of verses, that, that ones that you can use, that God can equip you with. Um, if you have a favorite verse, memorize it. One of the things we were going to do but we're not going to have time to do today is I was going to have you share your favorite memory verse with one another, something you've either memorized or just what your favorite verse of the Bible was. We're not going to have time for that today. We'll save that one for some other time. But I'll tell you mine. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Right? That's my story. The old is gone, the new has come. That's why that resonates with me. That's one of the first scriptures I ever memorized. And that's one of the few that I could actually quote verbatim in multiple versions of the Bible. But uh, anyhow, so, so, so that, that motivation, that... that that high level is one of the things we need to have. Um, if we have time, some other time, we'll go through some details on it. We'll talk about some of the things in the Bible that, that hopefully will motivate us. The second thing is, and, and I did this intentionally knowing that Erwin was going to pray, so I didn't pray right away. We'll close in prayer before we're gone. I didn't, I didn't not pray unintentionally. I just knew his prayer was somewhat lengthy, and so I didn't want to pray, have him then pray. Uh, it gets a little awkward, so I just let Erwin pray for us to start today, if you didn't notice that. But uh, we will pray before we leave here. But one of the things preparing our hearts is prayer. Um, Ruth, will you throw that up on the screen? Ruth is going to throw up a thing on the screen here. It's a tool, and, and I love tools. I love being equipped, and you'll see it here in a little second. Um, there is a website called Bless Every Home that you can go and be part of, and you can see this. Um, if you click on the yellow arrow top, left roof. It'll take you back to the other page first. Um, this is just kind of an overview of my dashboard. And you can all have this. This is free. You go to their website, give them your email, create an account, log in, and it'll go. A couple of you, including Lou. Lou, you're in my neighborhood, so you are within that 250 for me. Lou, Russell Gilbertson, and then I think they're the only two of our church that live close enough to fall. Ruth, Ruth was like, well, where am I? I'm like, you're outside my neighborhood. You don't get to be in my circle. Because <laughs> they limit how many you can have. So, so she's too far distance-wise for me to, to be in that 250 people. Um, but what this is is a... Uh, um, you can click on back onto the map if you would. It's the second or third one over on that yellow bar. Second one. There you go. So what it is, is you can see kind of where the red in the very center is where I live. If she clicks on that, that'll say my name and my wife's name. Uh, oh, yeah, can we, maybe that'll help. 
There we go. Thank you. Um, that little red thing is me, and the blue thing right above it is my house. And then the yellow ones are my neighbor's houses. And so you can see there's four different categories, and you can't see this because it's too small, but the red one is prayer. Um, can you read those? What are they, Ruth? Yellow is care. Prayer, care, share, share and, disciple. and disciple. So there's four different levels that you can click on each day to engage with your neighbors. Have you had a conversation with them? Then you could click on share, maybe. Did you go do Bible study at their house? You could click on disciple or whatever. And so this allows you to track the people immediately around where you live. And what this will do is, if you, if you allow it to, it's a fairly broad tool, it will send you an email each day reminding you to pray for all of your neighbors, and then it'll give you some scripture or some little encouragement to pray. If you don't know what to pray for today, pray this. Okay, just to make it super simple. And then there's places in there where you can keep notes and track all the encounters you have with the people. I've just started doing this, so mine is very obviously uh, not, not richly done yet. But this is a really cool tool. And it's called blesseveryhome.com. It's completely free. Um, we may, uh, I'm gonna, I've just started working on this a little bit. Um, we may eventually utilize this more broadly as a church and give you some access to levels you don't currently have. But if you're just looking for a way to, to know, so each one of those, if you clicked on them, those grays are the names of the people who live in that house. Now, it's not each and every house in the community. There is some, some gaps in there, but uh, it's pretty comprehensive for my neighborhood, at least in town. And I think if we were to do it out here, you would see your neighbors correspondingly. And if not, so what I'm going to do is uh, there's some stuff in there I know that's not in there. I'm going to go in and enter it manually so I have those people that I'm praying for in there. And I'm going to use this as a tool to help me pray. One of the things is preparing the soil. Now, we've got to prepare with other people, like I was talking about farming earlier, but we also have to prepare our hearts for evangelism. We need to be praying, and I've talked about this on a number of occasions, we need to be praying for people constantly and continually. Probably should have like a bookmark in your Bible, a list of five people that you are praying for, for opportunities to intentionally connect with, to share the gospel with. I guarantee every one of us has five people in our lives who need to know Jesus. I know without question. If you don't, Wow, you live in a bubble. Um, <laughs> but I, I know you don't. We all have five people, whether it's a cashier at the gas station we go to regularly, whether it's our mailman, whomever it is, being consistent in prayer for those people. Because as we pray for people, we begin to care for people. And as we care for people, we begin to want to share the gospel. Once we care, then we want to share. And so simply, one of the things I want you to take away today is to know that there is this tool and you can use this. I'll link to it on Facebook so that you can find it. You don't have to remember it. If you're not on Facebook, give me a call and I'll get you there. Um, but uh, blesseveryhome.com. It's totally free. Um, and so you could go in there. You could begin to utilize this. If you don't do that, it could be, like I said, the bookmark. There's lots of different things you could use. But have something. Be intentional. Um, evangelism doesn't happen generally by accident. And getting good at evangelism certainly doesn't happen by accident. This is something we have to work at. So begin to pray for people. Look for opportunities. And then just take them. You know, sometimes we do have to take leaps of faith. And if you think God is calling you to go do something or to share with somebody, be faithful in that and just do it. And if you flub up, okay, try again. Okay, that's not the end of the world. Don't become discouraged. Don't become scared. We're all in this together. One of the other things you could do is, is if you know somebody, so maybe Marie and I know the same guy. Okay, he lives down the road from Marie, Tom. I don't know who Tom is, he's imaginary. But Tom lives down the road and we both know Tom. Marie and I can agree, let's tag team Tom. Let's both start praying for Tom. Let's both start creating opportunities to communicate the gospel to Tom. And let's follow up with one another. Like, hey, Marie, did you talk to Tom this week? Oh, how's he doing? Oh, okay, great. Uh, I'll talk to you, I'll follow up. Oh, he's, he had, yeah, okay, I'll do that. I'll talk to him about that. You know, as we work together, we can really see amazing things start to happen. If there's somebody you know who doesn't go to church and lives in the neighborhood, maybe two or three of you say, hey, we need to start inviting that guy over. We need to invite that family over. We need to bring them in on a Wednesday night and just feed them. Let them see what we're doing. Whatever it is, whatever it takes, communicate it with one another and use that and be powerful. Uh, use that power that's in that, that, that combining of ideas and thoughts and prayers and See where God leads with it. He might change somebody's eternity. Glory be to God. And so those are the things that...
kind of for the short term I wanted to hit on um, and, and talk about. I wanted to make sure you saw this tool. There's lots of other tools. Um, the, the presentation Scott has, I'll save for another time, um, of the actual process of evangelism. But if you've never actually shared how to share the cross with somebody and you would like a link to that right away, uh, I can get you the video. It's on YouTube. Um, it's about a five-minute little video, and he takes a, a passage out of Romans and you know, draws the cross and how you get across that bridge. And It's a very you know, Bill Bright gospel evangelism explosion kind of explanation, but it's good. If you've never done it, it's a tool. And uh, I find myself, at least, when I don't know what I'm doing, if I can see somebody else do it, like on YouTube, but, you know, like if I need to change the brakes on my car, I don't always know how to do that. But if I can watch somebody else change the brakes on my car on YouTube, I can go out and do it, right? And it's kind of the same way with evangelism. I might not know exactly how to do this, but if I can watch this guy do it, ah, oh, I think I could do that on a, on a napkin at a restaurant while I buy somebody lunch or whatever it might be. So, so uh, if you need some equipping, let us know. Um, my, my goal is to continue equipping. We have a few more minutes, and so one of the things I want to do before we go is just gauge interest. Are you interested? Is this worthwhile? Is this something you'd want more of? Would you like to go into detail? I have 14 points. I have like 12 pages of really good material, not boring, I promise, of ideas of process and how we become more evangelistically focused as individuals and as a church. Um, if you want more of that, do we want more of that? Would you do this again? Would you give three hours some other Saturday? You would? Yeah? Yeah? yeah I'm not saying I don't have any dates set. I'm not asking you to commit to anything. But just a general feeling. If you thought this was worth it, then I think we can do this again. Um, I thought it was worth it. Anytime I can try to equip, you know. So the way the local church works, there's one of me and many of you. Local churches fail when they think the pastor has to do everything. I promise. I will be the absolute bottleneck to ministry if I'm the only person sharing my faith. If, if the church had some crazy idea that I'm the only one who can present the gospel, the gospel's not going to grow. But if I can equip, if I can teach, if I can instruct, if I can share resources and tools, if I can give you some training and then I can set you free... Even if you're only one-tenth of me, one-tenth times all the people here is a lot more than I could ever do. And I think you're much more than one-tenth of me. I, I just don't have any delusions that I'm a very gifted evangelist. But I can be faithful, and I can keep at it, and I can dust myself off when I fail, and I can keep going. And I think you can too. And if I can equip you in that way, and if we can keep doing that, I think we can do amazing things. And, and I hope you hear this because this is my vision. You know, I said we'd talk a little bit about vision today. You, you can write whatever words you want for a vision statement, but at the end of the day, it's telling people about Jesus. It's simply, we are beggars who found a piece of bread and telling somebody else where to get a meal. That is what the gospel is. I'm broken, I've been lost, and now I'm found and I've been saved. You know, it's the song of amazing grace. If you don't know scripture, go to Amazing Grace when you're sharing your faith. It will, it will get you there, over the finish line, very quickly. It's actually a really good way to share your faith as Amazing Grace because most of the people in our culture are familiar with it. So there's another tool for you if you need something. But with that, I um, would encourage you this week, if you don't have a list of five people, just start with five. I'm not saying you've got to do this to everybody. Just think five. Now, I would recommend you don't do all five grandkids. I mean, you can still do five grandkids. That's awesome. But I think you need to have more diversity than just that. Okay? Do a neighbor or two. Do a, a friend you grew up with in high school who still lives in town and you know is living a life that's not honoring God. Do people like that too. Yes, certainly pray for your grandkids. I'm not saying don't do that. But uh, have, have, a, have a broad cross-section of people that you are going to begin to pray for, that you are going to commit to pray for regularly. And then as you pray for them, begin to look for opportunities to share the gospel and then see what God does with it to his glory. That's all I ask of you. I'm not asking any more today than just that. Find five people to put on a piece of paper or put in your, maybe it's just in your brain. What, the way I first started doing this, I've mentioned this before, is... Uh, I used to write them on sticky pads and stick them on the dash of my car. 
This is when I used to live in the Twin Cities. So every time I'd come to a stoplight, I'd pray for those people. And when you're in the Twin Cities, there's a lot of stoplights. Don't do that one in Aiken County, okay? <laughs> you won't pray very much, okay? So find something else, but uh, some opportunity, because unless you're regular, unless you're intentional, it won't happen. So maybe you put it on your bathroom mirror. Every time you go to the bathroom in that bathroom, you go through and you wash your hands, you're going to look up and see five names. While you wash your hands, or while you brush your teeth, pray for those five people. If you start doing that, see where God takes it. That's all it takes to be faithful. This isn't some fancy plan. This isn't something that you have to have special gifting. You don't have to be Billy Graham. Just start to pray. And if you can do that, I believe we can change our families, we can change our community, and we can change the world. I, I, I may be naive, but I think that is possible because I think God can be in it. So with that, why don't we pray, and then I'll set you free, okay? Father God, I thank you for these men and women and their just willingness to come out and listen to a fool as I. Um, God, I, I don't have all the answers. I'm not perfect. I don't even have any delusions that I'm good at this. But I can be faithful. And if you can use a wreck like me, you can use a wreck like anybody else. And God, that is amazing because at the end of the day, it's for your glory and not ours. And we don't have to know the right words. We don't have to have memorized the whole Bible. We don't have to have all the answers to all the questions somebody might ask. All you ask is that we be faithful. So Lord God, I pray for these men and women this week that you'd create opportunities maybe to help them see chances to share the gospel. That you would help them see what the borders of their comfort is and that they would begin to push against it. That you would give them opportunities, Lord, just to be faithful. And then God, let them know deep in their hearts that when they fail, when they mess up, when the words don't come out right, you love them anyhow that it's okay, that we can get up and do it again. God, thank you for letting us be part of your team. Thank you for loving us, for choosing us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, that we could be forgiven and then share with joy his love for us. God, every day that we draw breath, it's truly a gift. We're humbled, we're thankful. So as we go forth, Lord, may we go forth with a restored, renewed, reinvigorated sense of your love and may we share it wherever you send us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you all. I do value you coming. If we do this again, bring a couple of friends. The more the merrier. All right? There's still lots of good stuff to eat, and treats and coffee and all that. Take some. Take it for the road. Take it to your kids. Maybe you're talking about taking something to your neighbor. You can go love them. Take some with you. That's fine. You got my blessing. It's all paid for. <laughs>